So here I am outside three days before Rosh Hashanah getting ready to check out the frame for my sukkah to see what kind of work I'm going to have to do to get it ready for Sukkot, which is in a couple of weeks. I start this early because uh, I don't have a prefab sukkah. You know, a lot of people use those plywood ones and those are fine. They're kosher, but they're expensive and they're also heavy to set up. So I use my Boy Scout skills and I lash together a framework and then I let it stand there. It can stand there. The framework can be permanent because it's not a sukkah until you cover it and you put some shkak, which is the greens we cut from the ground on the top. But today, I'm simply checking to make sure that everything is going to be okay. So when I go to put everything together uh, after uh, Yom Kippur, it, I won't have to spend a lot of time uh, making repairs. This is the structure that I use for my sukkah. During the summer, I use it as a trellis. And come fall, I take down all the vines. And I also am going to walk in and take a look and see what might need to be repaired because every year I've got to fix some of the joints. You find places where the um, twine has worn out. Here's one right here. So you can see right in here, this twine is all coming apart. And that's because the ultraviolet from the sun breaks it down. So it's a temporary structure. A silka is not something to stand there for decades. And so each year I have to check. I noticed there's a hummingbird feeder out here, and I'll have to take that down because that attracts bees. And, well, you don't want bees in the sukkah. But on the other hand, you know, they do remind us of the teaching of Rabbi Raphael, the Bershad Rebbe, who said that egotistical people sometimes reincarnate as bees. Why bees? Well, in Yiddish, which is similar to German, ich bin means I am. And ich biene means I am a bee. So they're very close. And so he makes a pun on that and says, e bees buzz around, bzz, 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 and egotists do the same thing. They're always buzzing around. I'm an important person. I'm a rich man. I'm a rabbi. I I'm a politician. I'm whatever. And you got to listen to me because I'm a big honcho here in town, you know? And so because they're always buzzing all over the place with ego, they come back as a bee. Now, bees live in a hive where, except for the queen who lays the eggs, etc., most of the bees all do the same thing. They're all equal. Every little bee is on the same level as every other little bee. They all have the same kind of jobs. They make the honey. They, they take care of the young. They build the hive, etc. And the idea is that by being in a colony like that, a community where you have to work with others, an egotistical person learns how to cooperate and not be so egotistical, and then hopefully they will come back again as a human being. And so that's the story, and it's good to keep that in mind. When you see bees buzzing around, we say, be a busy little bee, but you want to make sure you're a busy bee for the community and for the world and not just for yourself. Okay, my sukkah frame is ready for me to put the covering on the outside and the shkak on the top. As you can see, the leaves are turning. Uh, this is in the fall in the Northern Hemisphere. And there's a Hasidic teaching that says, why is it we move out into a cold, drafty sukkah in the fall? Most people, you know, go inside for the winter. And if they're going to come out, they come out in the spring. Now, in the Southern Hemisphere, this will be in the spring. But most of the Jewish holidays are coordinated to the Northern Hemisphere because that's where Israel is. So why do we go into the sukkah in the fall? I, it's because 
we are showing that we're doing this because God commanded us to do this. It may not necessarily be comfortable. Uh, we eat our meal. We're going to eat our meals in here and sing and, and celebrate. Unfortunately, this year, because of COVID-19, I'm not going to have a lot of guests in my sukkah. But we're doing it because it's a commandment of God, that they shall dwell in booths for seven days. And there's the seven days of Sukkot. And then there's also the eighth day of Simchat Torah, which is really a separate holiday, but it's tacked right onto the end of Sukkot. So we think of it as eight days, even though it's actually seven. I thought I'd note here that uh, some of the joints that I reinforced are tied with strips of an old T-shirt. That's what that purple stuff is. My wife had a shirt she was going to throw away, and when I went to look for the twine that I had bought to make repairs, I couldn't find it. So I tore the t-shirt into strips and used that. And besides, it's good for the environment to repurpose things. We throw away so many things that might be useful. Our ancestors probably would have done something similar, tear strips of cloth and tie it with that, and it's working just fine. This year, I'm adding something new to my sukkah. I got this string of solar lights, and I'm going to put those up on the top inside, and that way this will charge. I'll put the little charger up on one of the poles, and I won't have to worry about stringing electric cords out here or shorting them out or rained on them. Besides, this is more ecological, so I think this will work out very well. I'm out in the woods now in the back of my property, getting ready to cut the shkak, the natural materials for the top of the sukkah. That could be anything that grows from the ground, any kind of plant. Uh, you know, and some people use bamboo as so they can store it for the winter. I usually go out and I just cut something in the woods that I want to get rid of anyway. So today I'm going to use buckthorn, which is an invasive species. It's a shrubby bush kind of thing. And the leaves stay on that longer than the leaves on the regular trees. So that works out well. And true to its name, buckthorn does have thorns, so I have a good heavy pair of, of gloves, and I'm going to go and get some, and I'll drag it back up to the house. These are buckthorn seedlings. Obviously, they're too small to use for shkak, but I wanted to show you this. You often find patches like this growing under tall trees, like this very large old-growth oak, probably a couple hundred years old growing out here. I'm sure it survived the Hinkley fire in the 1890s. And there goes a squirrel. I don't know if you can see him or not, but there's a squirrel there. The birds eat the buckthorn berries, and then they sit up high in the trees. And of course, the seeds go right through the bird, and they come down, drop on the ground. And that's how you get these patches underneath old growth trees. I got to go look now for some bigger buckthorn plants so that I can cut the shock and get my sukkah going. Oops, had to make a run for it. All of a sudden, the storm came up. It's hailing, and I'm hanging out in the chicken coop with my chickens, waiting for this to get over so I can go back out and finish cutting shkak. Never can tell with Minnesota. You know, every five minutes, the weather seems to change. Well, the storm's letting up. You know, if you look in the Kisser Shulchan Aruch, which is a sort of handbook of Jewish law, it says in there the Jews should not cut their own shkak for the sukkah, but should buy it from a non-Jew. Well, well, why would that be the case? It's not because you might get rained on or you might get in, you know, dirty. No, no, it's not it. It's because back then people believed that a Jew standing in their fields would make the crops fail. They believed the Jew would make the milk go sour and the cows would dry up. We used to get burned at the stake as being witches, which we weren't, but they thought we were. And so it was a whole lot safer to, to just get the shock from somebody who would cut it and bring it into town. But this is my own land where I live and I own, and so I can go ahead and cut my own stuff. I do wear orange when I go out into the woods because in addition to being just before Sukkot right now, it's also the hunting season. So I don't want to be mistaken for a deer by some nearsighted hunter. But aside from that, you know, it's perfectly safe to go out and a wonderful thing to do. And it does appear the rain is starting up again, so I'm going to have to log off for now. Okay, I've got the outside of the sukkah covered now. As you can see, I used some old sheets and an old blue bedspread. The sides can be made with anything. 
Over the years, I've used a lot of different materials. One year, I used cardboard. Another year, I tacked up old feed sacks. Well, this material I got at the thrift store very cheaply last year, and I've still got it, so that's what I'm going to use. Inside, you can get a better look at how I lashed all this together. And this is about 8 feet by 8 feet, which gives me enough room to put in a table and chairs. One of the requirements for a sukkah is that it has to be open to the sky. It can't be under a tree. Now, if we look up here, we'll find that, yes, we are directly under the sky. There's some trees to the right and behind. There's trees all around us, actually. Finding a flat spot where I could put my sukkah open to the sky was a bit of a challenge. The next step will be to put the shkak on top. These are poles that I cut out in the woods to support the greens that I cut a few days ago. And I also have a little fireplace here, so if later in the week I want to have a cookout, I can do that during Kolomoid, the intermediate days of the festival. I'm standing inside the sukkah now, looking up through the shkak. You're supposed to have more shade than sun, but not so thick that you can't see the sky. And I think this will do. And so as of this moment, this is a sukkah. And here you have it, as seen from the outside. Uh, the decorations are optional, but I like to do a little something to pretty it up. These are my solar candles, which charge up during the day. You set them outside, bring them back in in the evening, and you got the candle light. And uh, the little lights I mentioned earlier to put around the top, these solar lights, they're not as bright as I would have liked, but they certainly look festive. So I added this Lucy Solar Lantern here, which also charges during the day and then works at night. This is not a commercial, really, but I, I do like this product. So everything in my sukkah this year is all solar, no fire. We want to be safe with fire because, after all, I'm getting a little bit too old <laughs> to rake the forest. <laughs> so the sukkah is up. It's done. And tonight, my wife and I will celebrate Sukkot together in here. We're not going to have guests this year because of COVID-19, although we will have the seven shepherds who spiritually come. There's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Aaron, Joseph, and David. Each night of Sukkot, we invite a different one of them in. And of course, God will be here too. I feel so blessed to even have a sukkah because I know that there are people who, for various reasons, can't have one this year. Maybe they can't get to a communal sukkah they normally go to, or maybe they are in an institution and they're not going to put one up because they don't want a lot of people crowded together and possibly spreading the virus within an institution environment. Well, I remember a story told to me about Rebbe Nachman of Breslov. When he and his disciple were traveling to the Holy Land in the time of the Napoleonic Wars, they were very worried that they might be taken prisoner either by the enemy or perhaps by pirates who might sell them into slavery. And what would they do then if they couldn't keep Shabbat, if they couldn't keep the holy days? Rebbe Nachman thought about this and came to the conclusion that when you're under duress, when you have no control over the situation that you're in, God will count your desire to do a mitzvah. If you truly, deeply want to want, you deeply want to do a mitzvah, then God will count your desire. And so, in whatever way you are celebrating Sukkot, I wish you a Chag Sameach, a happy holiday, and I pray that next year we will have a much better way of celebrating Sukkot and that we will all be together once again in our temporary little shelters for this festival. Chag Sameach, have a wonderful holy day, and I celebrate a beautiful harvest.